Hi everyone, I can see um, some people signing into the call. It's great to see you all. We'll just give it a couple of minutes for everyone to, um, to join. Great, it looks like people are filling in, which is fantastic. Um, so hello and welcome to this IMP info session where we will be exploring the IMP consensus to help understand a company's impact on people and the planet. Here is an outline of the session. After a brief introduction, I will introduce you to my colleague Clara, who will be taking us through the session and looking at ways to measure and manage impact using the IMP consensus. This will be the recorded part of the session, after which we'll take a quick look at um, future IMP sessions and conclude with a Q&A. Great. So Today, it is myself, Joe Fackler, and my colleague, Clara Barbie, on this webinar, which forms a series of IMP info sessions. These are designed to, help, um, to provide you with relevant and updated guidance based on the IMP's work. And we also wanted to signpost you to practical guidance and take questions, also give you the chance to share your own experiences, whether you are an, an organization that is using this consensus for your own impact measurement and management practices, or say a consultant or network that is communicating this work broadly. As mentioned, the main body of content will be recorded, but then we'll, um, we'll stop that recording and take queries in a chat and house rules setting. Um, we'll make sure that you're all off mute by that time um, so that you can all participate. And so with that, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Clara. Joe, thank you so much. Um, and just to remind everyone, when Joe says IMP consensus, what we mean by that is, you know, we, we are a forum for practitioners and disciplines of all kinds to come together and talk about what they agree on, what they don't agree on when it comes to impact measurement and management. And so when we say consensus, that's our playing back to you where we hear practitioners and experts from, from a range of different parts of the market and disciplines agree. Um, and, and, I, and I don't say that lightly, some of these things have been hotly debated, but, but the, the, what we call the consensus are really what you might think of as norms for sensible ways of doing things and a sensible logic of how things relate to each other that seem to be widely agreed across disciplines. And it doesn't mean they're agreed on by everyone. It means that they represent a, you know, a large cross section of practitioners who've been involved in this effort. Um, and, I, and so it, the reason why I give that caveat is that you know, this, is, this is moving, it's a moving target because I think all of us learn and grow. And so the reason why we run these info sessions is to make sure that we share with you what we're seeing at the coalface as we, as we see more and more organizations come together to build consensus and where things might be evolving or, um, or getting more detailed in terms of what they look like. And I, and I think that the most important thing for me to share with you on that front is that as many of you on the call will know, we shifted from being um, just a forum where lots of practitioners could come together, which we still are through our online presence in partnership with Harvard Business Review. But we also now facilitate this network of standard setting organizations, 13 global standard setting organizations. And that work has allowed us to really um, get very, very specific on how do the standards in the market, and we can talk about the word standard later, but we're using it in its broad sense not it doesn't necessarily need to be a specific standard in terms of something that two organizations can compare performance against like a metric or an indicator although we absolutely do work with organizations that develop metrics and indicators it could be standard in terms of standards of process or practice um, or it could be higher level principles so we're using the word standard broadly but we're working with these organizations that are putting standards into the market to encourage organizations to do things in the same way and one of the things I really want to dig into with you is how the standards out there relate to the kind of common sense logic that we spent a lot of time um, working with people to agree on. Because I think that that's where you move from 
theory to the practical reality of certainly companies today who are faced with this universe of standards. So that's the very big picture context of on IMP and what we mean by consensus. Joe, if you could go to the next slide. Um, this is a helpful starting point for today because we realized pretty early on in this process that there were different interpretations of not only the term impact, but also the term ESG. And when it came to talking about measurement and what kind of information companies should be disclosing, um, there were actually quite different perspectives on, on what complete information looks like, what, what's in scope. And so I wanted to start with this. It's, it's conceptual, but I, I would love, I welcome questions from you later on whether this is helpful to you. But it allows you to say, if you look at a company today and you look at that Y axis, um, you know, a company's full value chain is having impacts on people and the planet. So everything from its supply chain through to its operations, through to its distribution, through to um, the usage of its products and services. All of those things are caught, they're engaging with the world in some way and, and they're causing impacts. And those impacts, if you look at the x-axis, will be both negative and positive in general in any company. Even the most fastidious social enterprise will have probably a carbon footprint and therefore have some negative impacts. Um, it may even have some governance issues. There's a whole range of things that even when you're doing very good things are, are, you know, are also need to be managed as bad things. And likewise, a multinational corporation, a, you know, a very complex beast will, will usually be a mix of negative and positive impacts. And that's what you can see reflected on the, the horizontal axis. But the really important point about measurement is that metrics themselves are, are typically not intended to be intrinsically negative or positive. So tons of carbon isn't necessarily a bad thing because it could be that you're a renewable business and you're actually your net tons of carbon is a positive contribution you're offsetting. Um, likewise with megaliters of water withdrawal, if you're a desalination plant, that could be positive or negative. Um, clearly the same is true with wages. Um, relating to the outcome of income. Um, you know, if you, you can pay below the local minimum wage or indeed living wage, if that's establishable, um, or you can pay above it. And, and the difference between those two things can be the difference between negative and positive. And so the point of this diagram is just to say that it's not that information itself, the, sorry, the metrics themselves are intrinsically negative or positive. It's the performance on the metrics that can be interpreted as negative or positive. And the only way that interpretation can be made is if there is a social or ecological threshold or norm that tells you at what point an outcome stops being negative and starts being positive. And, and I, I mentioned that to you because a lot of the time when we've spoken about measurement um, as an industry, we focus on the metrics what you're going to see if you haven't encountered it already is a very strong advocation going forwards for those always to be relative to thresholds or norms wherever they're available so that you can actually make sense of the performance and say whether it's negative or positive. So that was just the kind of a few observations about companies' information and the different parameters that we need to be looking at. If you then add another lens to this, um, you start to get into, okay, but what, what subset of this information is actually relevant to a company who is motivated from a commercial perspective? So the outer ring I've just shown you, that, that large gray circle, the largest one, you can think of that as the universe of impacts that are material to the world that a company should be measuring and managing if it's honoring its stakeholders. But clearly there's a subset of that performance data which is also, it also has a financial ramifications for the company and, it, and, that, and that can be over the medium term. So if you look at scope one, two and three carbon emissions, classic example, you know, scope one carbon emissions, actually Joe, if you go to the next circle, you can see that there's an inner circle, which is something that's financially material now. It's gonna hit the books in the next 12 months because regulation is coming in or it's a huge reputational issue that um, the press is starting to write about and it's gonna cause reputational damage in the next 12 months. There's definitely that nuance between something that's immediately financially material vis-a-vis -vis over a slightly longer time frame, And you can see that represented by these two inner circles. And what I wanted to flag to you all was that the, um, 
that if you think about scope one, two, and three emissions, today, scope one emissions, a company, according to the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, for example, whose entire business model is to do the research on which of the, of the metrics that you can look at performance on are likely to be financially material within a given industry. That's how SASB's, um, what they call metrics are organized. And you know they, they've long had scope one emissions as being financially material for a number of different industries in the near term. But it's increasingly clear that actually scope two, it really is, is also financially material these days. And actually scope three as well, one can, could argue, is, is increasingly becoming something that companies really should focus on, even though it's harder to look out at their tier two, three suppliers, for example. And so what, what I mentioned that example of scope one, two and three carbon emissions because it's a classic example of how these dotted circles are dynamic. And in, in effect, your metrics are gonna move, you know, something could go from being in the outer ring, in other words, it matters to the world, but it might not yet be financially material, to quite rapidly being in the inner ring, depending, um, as I said, on regulation, on press, um, on just sheer transparency and consumers wanting to hold companies accountable. So we see this as a very dynamic diagram. But the reason why we wanted to kick off with this is that if you're a company today, and this session is all about you know, how do companies in practice do this, if you're a company today, you're engaging with standards out there which actually are biting away at different parts of this pie. And if you look at um, the Global Reporting Initiative, for example, historically, it has not been wedded to metrics that are financially material. So it's always been the big gray ring, as it were. It's covered the full range of things that matter to stakeholders. However, it, has, it, you know, it does have indicators on products and services it says that companies should, should disclose their products and services and the consumer segments and the beneficiaries that buy those products and services. It doesn't go much more detailed than that on the particular impacts of those products and services in the standards. And I think, it ref I think GRI's um, sensible approach is to sort of where it's not going to provide additional standards or, or prescriptive indicators, it will refer you to just use the best available standards. Um, and so it's not, it's not as though GRI isn't acknowledging the importance of, of impacts that occur through use of products and services, but it's not itself developing prescriptive metrics um, for lots and lots of different industries yet on that front. And so it's important to be aware when you're using GRI that it perhaps covers less of the top half of this at the moment and focuses more on the bottom half. Um, as I said, that's a, we're talking about this at a moment in time and I would fully expect GRI to to kind of evolve and cover as much of this as possible over time, especially since it's doing its sector supplements now. Now, if you engage with GRI, but you also engage with GINs Iris Plus, for example, their Navigating Impact Project has really focused um, on the top right of this diagram. It's focused on looking at agriculture, off-grid energy, affordable housing, and trying to look at where metrics can be standardized for those particular segments of products and services. So it's complementary, um, and you could indeed use both that and GRI in a sensible way. And then as I said before, SASB is, is a great additional lens because they go industry by industry and try to ring fence those metrics that are in these gray circles in the middle that performance on those metrics is likely to be financially material. And finally, I'll close by saying that something like the Science-Based Targets Initiative is really that red line you know, it's looking for what are the, the thresholds from a science perspective that we should be striving for to meet, for example, the 1.5 degrees scenario for carbon. And so you see various initiatives now trying to work on those thresholds, that red line. And I wouldn't ever want them to be confused with the data standards, the GRIs, the SASBs, the GINs IRIS, for example, because they're different things. They have different functions and in fact, they're, they're complementary. Um, so that's the beginning um, kind of very high level picture on what is the complete you know, set of information that companies should be disclosing look like. And, and the final comment I will make to you on this is that we've had some really rich conversations with the structured network organizations, these standard setters, um, which range from the UN agencies and the IFC to the OECD and then um, GRI, SASB, GIN, et cetera. And we've, you know, we've, we've talked about this idea of complete um, information and, and the reason why we've spent a long time on it is that I think sometimes in the market from a company perspective which is what this webinar is about there's a sense of having to pick or choose between standards 
and clearly there is, you know, there is some duplication. There, there are so many standards that one could absolutely argue that, there's, that it's, it's confusing. But actually, certainly with the 13 standard setters we've been working with, um, we would argue that their, their content is actually complementary and it enables you to provide complete information because they are developing work on different parts of this diagram, which itself kind of all fits together. And I, and I think that the, this idea of complete, we spent a long time debating it because instead of feeling that you have to choose between disclosing only the financial material or, or, or not talking about what's financial material and only disclosing what matters to the world, regardless of whether it's financially material. What we learned from facilitating conversations with the standard setters was that actually the reality is companies are accountable to a variety of stakeholders. And, and it's even if you look at companies' investors, particularly big companies' investors these days, they're not a homogenous group. And so some investors may indeed care only about the darker gray shaded circle on that bottom left quadrant, right? You could absolutely argue that the history of ESG integration in the public markets has really focused on, you know, what, what is the financially material kind of primarily operational impacts of big public companies? And how can we look at those to reduce risk? Now, over time, ESG integrations become more sophisticated and you've seen people go beyond that, but that is clearly a real area of focus of ESG integration. But a lot of the investors that are now investing in those same companies are saying, yes, but we're interested in the SDGs too. And actually we want to know about top right. We want to know about your products and services and we want to go all the way to the outer ring and, and look at things that may not be financially material, but because we are a healthcare pension fund, we think that they are important to our pensioners, that, that, that improving health outcomes is important to our pensioners. Um, and as long as it doesn't conflict with our fiduciary duty, um, we actually want to look at as much information as possible. And so even within in the investor base, there will, it won't be homogenous and you will see investors with different objectives wanting different sets of information. And clearly when, government, when companies think about accountability to governments, to local regulators, to consumers, to civil society organizations who often represent underserved populations without agency, mm -hmm. all of those stakeholders that the company has are going to want um, information across this diagram and not necessarily limit it to, for example, to the bottom left quadrant. So that's what I mean by complete, is this idea that companies are accountable to a whole range of stakeholders and they need to look at providing a data set that can meet those stakeholders' needs. Jo, I'm gonna, um, I, I realize that was a long intro and context setting, um, but let's move now on to the next slide and obviously welcome questions on this later when we get it, because I think this is a, a diagram we've used to help ground some of these conversations that were otherwise difficult because people sort of were talking at different, different at cross purposes, framing things from their perspective. And that diagram was a place, you know, was a way for everyone to find their place. Um, but I, I think it's something that can be hugely improved. And so that's something I would welcome all of your feedback on. Um, okay, so the rest of the session with that context is then gonna go into these norms that um, were widely agreed on for the first couple of years that IMP facilitated and, and look at it from the company's perspective. So we're gonna talk about what is impact and therefore what are the dimensions of performance that companies need to be looking at to measure and manage. And then we're going to talk about the types of data that you therefore need to be collecting as a company and what you do when you can't get that data, which is almost the reality for most companies most of the time. And then we're gonna talk about the so what. You've collected the data, what can you, what does that mean in terms of the story you can tell about the kind of company that you are? So Joe, if we could just go to the five dimensions first. And I, and I realize that many of you may have come across these before, so I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time on it, but the definition of impact has been a really fascinating and, um, and kind of not fraught at all, just a really fascinating conversation because uh, there've been a range of definitions used historically from organizations such as the OECD, um, who we work with, to the World Bank, um, and obviously within evaluation um, uh, in development. Um, and some have defined impact as being a question of time frame, so long term versus short term. However, when we really prodded on that and looked at lots of different examples, people felt that um, it was they were there was nervousness about actually committing impact to be a question of time because you can have um, in the examples that people looked at, impact can, be, can occur 
in a huge way from an earthquake happening tomorrow. Um, and you can have um, things that people would measure and describe as impacts that don't, that aren't a question of, of kind of a, a time frame, you know, looking at something that happens um, kind of short term, medium term, long term. That didn't feel like a consistent way to frame what impact is. The other framing that we bumped into um, that was really important to talk about was relative to counterfactual. So in other words, is impact the just the outcome minus what would have happened anyway, which has been a, a, um, a framing that's been used relatively consistent, consistently in the carbon markets, um, in areas of social science. And so we talked through all of those things um, with the different disciplines. And I think what was used, what, what I'm playing back to you here is where people, what we're hearing are kind of emerging consensus right now. And it doesn't mean that these particular words will be where all these organizations land, but it gives you a sense of, of what people seem to be sensibly agreeing on, which is that an outcome is the result of an action or event. In other words, it's if an output is within a company's control, and again, I'm looking at this entire session, I'm looking at this from the perspective of a company, you know, your outputs are something you can control. But the outcome is the point at which your output interacts with a population or a natural resource. And you might partially control that outcome because it's your output that is causing it, but you don't wholly control it because that population or that resource um, has control as well. And it's the interaction between the two that causes the outcome. Um, and I think a really useful direction of travel, and the OECD has been very influential here, is to say that a well-defined outcome is one that is defined as much as possible as an aspect of social, environmental, economic well-being. And so, and I, and I say that because, to be frank, the term, like defining an outcome is not, it's not a scientific process, as many of you who do this firsthand will know well. It's very difficult to know for sure, is this the right outcome? Um, if you're talking about selling cars as an output and then you're looking at mobility as an outcome, one could easily argue that mobility is only valuable because actually it enables connectivity to other human beings or it enables X, Y, Z. And it's that further outcome, as it were, that is the right one to define. And I could go on and on with a hundred examples. Um, the, the reality is, uh, and this is very much the framing of enough precision for the decision, I think people are, are comfortable with the idea that as long as you, you go as far as you can in defining that outcome in relation to an aspect of well-being that's intrinsically valuable. So pe some people argue that income is intrinsically valuable. Others argue that it's a means to an end and you need to go beyond that. Um, and I, and I didn't, we didn't feel it was productive to try and fight over these specific circumstances, but rather to see whether there was agreement that one should strive to frame the outcome um, as an aspect of intrinsic well-being uh, as far as possible. And that's entirely consistent with the OECD's direction of travel on this. And then an impact would be the change in that outcome caused by an organization. And that caused by an organization is what allows you to look at the counterfactual. Um, and, and then the important caveat was that that change is direct or indirect, whole or partial, intended or unintended. Um, and, and that's just the kind of the clarity on that to prevent people thinking that your impact is only what you intend for example. Now, there was, a, I think, an incredibly valuable conversation with some of the organizations. I don't know whether they're on the phone right now, so please do jump in in the Q&A. Um, but a very, very valuable conversation about, okay, but how, what about valuation? You know, for, for some organizations, impact is the point at which you turn the outcome into an actual value, and indeed a value to society, a socioeconomic value is the way that many thought about it. What we're hearing is that it's, it's, you don't have to, it's not an either or. In other words, an impact can be that change in outcome caused by the company, but, and one can express that as a change in a level of outcome, and we'll look at some indicators later on, but one could also convert that into a socioeconomic value. And indeed one could convert it into a socioeconomic value for, for an individual, or look at it in terms of socioeconomic value to society at large. And rather than those being alternatives that are mutually exclusive, they're just they're different levels of precision or perspective that one can go to when considering impacts. And we should see them as, as different tools that we have and not assume that one has to say impact is only, for example, socioeconomic value to society. And I thought that whether that's where people end up is still TBD, but just in terms of our conversations with these network organizations, that felt like a very healthy conversation to be having um, in terms of people not saying it, it has to be one way or the other.
So that's the, that's the blurb on outcome and impact, which I wanted you to be aware of. Again, this is about kind of sharing what we're seeing at, at the cold face, as it were. But then the dimensions of impact that one would measure seem to be consistently relevant, um, which is that you need to talk about what, what the outcome is. You need to look at whether it's positive or negative, which requires use of some norm or threshold. Um, and you need to know whether the outcome matters, which is different to whether it's positive or negative. Um, Social Value International, with whom we work, have done a lot of work on the importance piece, and, and it's crucial. Um, in many ways, what the SDGs have tried to do by country is to codify what policymakers see as important to the populations in their country. And so that, that's why I think people often use those country-specific SDG priorities as a, as a proxy for what could be seen as important at a given a regional level. Um, the UNDP is doing some really interesting work, for those of you who, who want to look at it, um, called Impact Intelligence, looking at the SDG policy priorities by country. So do go to the SDG Impact website if you want to learn more about that. Um, the second dimension is who it's occurring for the outcome and how underserved they are. The third is then the degree of change um, and, and, you're, and counting the number of people that that's happening for. And of course, looking at its duration, how long it lasts for. The fourth is the contribution, which at its most rigorous would be netting off the counterfactual, which you could do using a controlled trial. You could even go as far as looking at attribution and the, and the, you know, the, the actual percentage of change, as it were, that the the organization can, can take credit for. Um, but that level of precision is not required for contribution to be a useful assessment. In other words, people felt that we heard felt very comfortable saying, you know, it is just in, inappropriate or either ethically inappropriate or indeed just practically infeasible to do a control trial for a company for all of its impacts. It's just ridiculous to even imagine that one could do that. And therefore, let's not say that one shouldn't, the company shouldn't at least think through well, is what I'm doing adding value? Do I understand my role in driving this impact vis-a-vis -vis the other forces at play? And that, that that just kind of assessment in a common sense way was a way to think about contribution, um, even if one couldn't go as far as, as measuring counterfactual. And I thought that was a healthy conversation because I think some people wanted to throw out additionality as it were entirely, but by calling it contribution, there was a comfort that actually this is just a sensible assessment of value add at a minimum. And then finally, risk is looking at akin to financial risk, but this is looking at the risk of impact, the likelihood that that impact does not occur as expected. So those dimensions come up time and time again um, as being the ideal complete set of information you would want about a particular impact to understand it fully and indeed to compare it appropriately so that you're actually comparing apples to apples rather than just, for example, comparing two impacts based on the outcome where those outcomes could be occurring for populations that had very different baselines. You know, one company could be creating jobs and paying a living wage to people who had good jobs already and were very skilled and capable of getting jobs elsewhere. Um, and, and there was little value add in terms of addressing unemployment. And another company could be taking um, formerly very low skilled or un long-term unemployed individuals and providing them with the training to get them to that living wage income which wouldn't have happened otherwise. And, and so unless you have information across these other dimensions, comparing just based on the outcome alone is misleading. So that's on definition. Joe, I'm gonna go quickly now through the rest because I think that's probably the most important thing to, to ground us in. Because the data categories, which is the next bit, is please don't think this is getting all that more complicated. I've really just talked about it. It's just the types of information that you would need against each of those dimensions in order to have a complete data set. And it looks daunting because there's a lot there. In reality, what happens most of the time is that proxies are used and there's lots of gaps in these data categories. You don't have all of this information. And, it's, and, and, and that's not necessarily a, a kind of a problem such that one should just give up and not try at all. It's just what we wanted to do in this, in this project was have an, an, an ideal understanding of what complete information would look like that was truly comparable across companies and then work back from that and say, okay, what is, what is a good proxy there for? And what do we need to be really wary of when we're using proxies because of the gaps in these different types of information? So you can look at this in your own time because we're going to circulate the slides, but these are the, the categories of data that a company would ideally collect for each of its material impacts. Now you might say, well, well how on earth do you know what's material? And companies have so many impacts that um, it's just terrifying the idea of doing this. Actually, 
in reality, what companies have said to us time and time again is that it's a very iterative process. So in general, what you do, and the, and the Capitals Protocol has got some good um, work on this as well. In, in reality, what you do as a company is you start by looking at your stakeholders and you will usually go through an exercise of estimating, well, we think for these stakeholders, these are probably the kinds of outcomes that are happening. And you'll probably think of those outcomes at a relatively high level. Um, so you might say something like income. Um, you know, we employ lots of people and we're paying them wages. And that's probably going to be a material impact that we have. And you will look across your products in the same way and your supply chain. And then you will go through this very iterative process of collecting enough information across these categories on those impacts to quickly say whether something warrants getting more information on because it's really likely to be material and therefore you want to spend the resources on going deep on it versus quickly saying, do you know what, we're talking about very few people here and probably very, very marginal change in this outcome or indeed an outcome that just doesn't really feel to be, it's not that important to that population based on the evidence that we have. And that iterative process of kind of going back and forth between assumptions you're making, hypotheses you're making about impacts and then testing them with data against these categories and quickly saying, yes, they're material, let's do more work, let's get a more complete data set or no, they're not, let's, let's kind of park that and say it's not material to manage at least this year and we might revisit it that in practice is probably the most important part of impact management that companies go through and i don't want to pretend to you all that it's not hugely iterative um, because i just think it is and um, indeed you could argue very easily that the same is true with financial accounting which obviously which also uses the concept of materiality from a financial perspective and one needs to make similar assumptions there as well and we've become really quite comfortable with that on the financial accounting side. And so I think we need to be similarly comfortable about that iteration on the impact side. If you can go to the next slide, Joe, um, this is just for you to look at later. It's an example of employment. And so it shows you the information across these data categories that one would collect to look at the impact you're having on employees through payment of wages. And you can see that the outcome level is the income per hour that's relative to a local living wage. Um, you might look at whether income is important to your employees through using a survey, and then you need to look at who those employees are. You might look at some stakeholder characteristics, such as the region or country that they're from, the boundary, but you might also, you will definitely want to look at the baseline. So what were they being paid before in the prior period, as it were, if you're trying to establish the degree of change and how much um, you've increased their income and clearly you'll look at scale, what some people call reach, which is the total number of people that are experiencing that. And then you will want to look at counterfactual. And what you can see here, this is a real company. And it, it decided that the most useful counterfactual for it to understand was, well, what this is a domiciliary care business. What would these workers likely have been paid elsewhere in the domiciliary care industry? Because actually their assumption is not that these people would otherwise have been unemployed, but rather that they would have been employed by a company that was paying um, lower wages. And so they've used here the average industry wage in domiciliary care, which you can see is, is, is below what they are able to pay their employees because they're being very thoughtful about this. And, and this is actually a cooperative business that is deliberately trying to increase income for its um, for its cooperative members. So that's just giving you a quick flavor of, of what an ideal complete data set would look like and how these, these data categories relate to each other. I wanna go from that to specifically looking at outcome level, baseline and depth and, and highlight to you that, you know, it was frustrating to have to lay these out as categories of data because in reality, these things are all, that if you're looking at this from a spreadsheet perspective as a company and you're looking at trying to show your impact on a given population year on year, these concepts are, um, are actually um, intrinsically related to each other. In other words, your outcome level, your what, is what you're paying a, comp a, a person in this particular example in a given time period. And so you can see that that's been laid out here. And then actually your who, that un how underserved are they, is just the outcome in the prior period. It's the baseline. What were they being paid? And you can see that laid out here. So you can see the 750 is the who, and then, this, and then the, the 950 that they're being paid now is the level that you've got them to. So that's the outcome that you wanna talk about, which is the what. And then the degree of change is the delta between those two things. And, and that, so it's from a data perspective, really simple. You're just looking at kind of T0 to T1 as it were, 
where was this population in, with regard to this outcome in the prior period? Where is it now? What's the outcome that my company's got them to? And then therefore, what is the degree of change between the two? And, and I, and I want to spell that out because I think one of the most interesting discussions we had with companies was they intuitively felt that they, their impact was deep with some of their impacts. But when we asked them what they meant by having a deep impact, and we looked at the data and sort of started to probe, well, why do you think that impact feels deep relative to this other one? It was actually because from a data perspective, it was the degree of change. It was how much the population had moved from the baseline where they were to the outcome in the period. Um, and so that obviously gave real precision to this otherwise quite intuitive concept of depth. Um, I will just close on that by saying that Here's a, we're using a quantitative example here and you're probably scratching your head thinking, yeah, but so much of this information that's useful is qualitative. It's people's increasing confidence, um, empowerment. There's lots and lots of different impacts we're all measuring and managing, which are harder to quantify as this one has been. I have to say some of the really great work being done by the likes of 60 decibels, social value, key and accountability, using surveys are, are an excellent affordable technique to look at the degree of change um, that populations are experiencing, particularly on the qualitative front. I mean, those survey techniques are amazing for a whole variety of reasons, particularly in terms of getting real feedback data from the people whose lives are changing. So, so don't think I'm underselling it, it's that you should consider surveying for a, a wide range of reasons, but it's also particularly relevant to looking at depth when it comes to qualitative outcomes and the change in those qualitative outcomes. It's a very um, brilliant tool. For, for allowing you to do that. If you can then go to the next slide. Um, I just wanna make the point that ESG, so everything we've talked about now is ideal and might feel very far away from what's possible in a company. And so I just wanted to dwell on proxies because proxies are crucial. Um, if you look at ESG indicators today, a lot of people say to me, ESG is different to impact. Um, and I say, well, what do you mean by that? And actually part of it's driven by that very first diagram, the pie with the rings we looked at, where actually what they mean is that ESG is a financially material subset of impact data. But sometimes what they mean is that ESG doesn't go far enough. In other words, it's not precise enough. And I think what, what is meant by that is that if you look at ESG data today, the indicators that are being used on the social front of ESG, the S, 92%, and I know this from academic analysis, 92% of the indicators that are driving ESG ratings today are efforts measures. In other words, do you have policies in place? Are you collecting information about the training you're providing? So activities and outputs, um, they are not outcomes. And, and there's really good reasons for it. I think some people think that that's just, you know, it means just ESG isn't very good. And I, I don't actually think that's a, a fair criticism. I think the reason why ESG metrics have evolved the way that they have is because they're trying to mainstream corporate disclosure. And the reality is that it's really hard to measure um, outcomes and especially to audit, which is ultimately what one would hope to get to with corporate disclosure on the non-financial side. Whereas obviously efforts data, whether a company has policies in place, but also increasingly whether it is you know, providing certain outputs is data that the company can control and therefore it can be much more easily and consistently disclosed and assured or audited. And so I think that's why ESG indicators look the way that they do. But the important point we want to make to you is it's not as though those are not proxies for impacts. In other words, if um, you look at the indicator that, for example, GRI and SASB are both using to look at employee training. So GRI measures, it, it asks companies to measure the hours per capita provided of employee training. SASB for certain industries um, actually asks for the dollar spent per capita on employee training. So slight variations there, but both of them are looking at training. But it's not as though those ESG indicators have been plucked out of thin air and someone's just decided that training you know, matters. It's because both of those standard setters have felt that based on their research and multi-stakeholder consultation, employee productivity, um, preventing employee mistakes on the job. All of those things really matter. And that there's evidence that goes to show that if you train your employees well and you spend money and time on that, employees are likely to be more product productive and make less mistakes. And that's why those indicators have been chosen. In other words, they've been backed into 
starting with what impacts one would like to measure in an ideal world and then saying, okay, what is a useful proxy for that? And so this relationship between the metrics that are driving a lot of ESG investment today and impact metrics is actually incredibly tight. And I, and I don't think there's anyone who would deny the fact that if one could measure impacts, all social and environmental impacts in every case, of course one would. It's the most precise form of data. Um, it's just in reality, it can be impractical or indeed the evidence base can be so strong about the link between the output and the outcome and the contextual factors can be so well understood that one can absolutely use a proxy with confidence. There aren't as many cases as one would like where that actually is the case, um, but it's really important to acknowledge that, that, that there are cases where proxies are actually, there's, there's very good reasons um, for using them. It's not just to do with what's practical. Um, so that's a, a, a kind of how impact data relates to efforts and also a kind of comment on how the world of ESG relates to this, which is that she was, that they are inextricably linked. Um, and if we could then go to the next slide, Joe, I'm just going to wrap up on saying, if you look at the indicators that are used by B-Lab, GRI, SASB, even IRIS, a lot of IRIS is using proxies. Um, you know, these ones here just give you a feel for exactly what I've just described. And it's not, as I said, it's not as though those proxies are just being used randomly. They are being used because um, they are proxies for impact, for outcomes and therefore changes in outcomes if you were to track those proxies over time. And so what I encourage you to do from a company perspective is to constantly say, well, is this proxy enough, giving us enough precision for the decision as it were? And, and please, we, we at the IMP encourage people to use standards wherever they exist because it is so helpful for comparability than organizations making up their own metrics without good reason. However, of course, it's important for you to reflect as companies on does this give us enough precision for the decision and actually can we go further than the proxy and actually measure the outcome and the change in the outcome. And that's really where we started by looking at all of those data categories. Um, if you then go to the next slide, Joe, this is just for you to take away and have a look at. We haven't talked about impact risk as much, which is that fifth dimension, but just to say to you that we had very useful, um, we facilitated very useful for, sort of conversations about risk and there were nine types of impact risk which came up time and time again as being relevant for companies to consider. Um, and in a way you can think of these akin to on the commercial side, there isn't a, um, a finite list of commercial risks you know, different companies and investors will use their judgments, but there's clearly risks that people w will have as kind of ones you consider as a kind of rule of thumb. And people, you know, so on the commercial side, you might always look at political risk or currency risk, et cetera, et cetera. Think of these nine risks on the impact side as equivalents. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list. It's meant to be the ones that crop up a lot. If you then go to the next slide, Joe, I'm going to just go, just literally comment on this and say to you all, these dimensions that we've been looking at and the data categories, they are the building blocks or the underlying um, drivers of both impact ratings that are really rigorous and um, monetization. So if you look in the market right now, some companies and, and obviously asset managers, particularly looking across companies, are using scoring methodologies to decide whether to invest in a company and then to manage to measure and manage its actual performance and score it. Um, you can see examples of this by root capital, you can see it by bridges, you can see it by um, a whole range of organizations out there, partners group, Actis, um, the IMP website's got lots of examples you can go through of ratings using these dimensions. And, and people don't, by the way, call these dimensions what, who, how much. We, we don't advocate for specific language. It's not a framework in that way. It's, it's meant to be a checklist, but you will see these dimensions crop up time and time again in rigorous ratings. You see them in the B, the B Labs B Impact Assessment, which also has um, coordinated with this effort to make sure that those dimensions are covered in its impact business model assessment. And then on monetization, if you look at, for example, TPG Rise Fund and the monetization methodology that they use, um, it is literally um, the formula that they use to get to a socioeconomic value of an impact is these data categories multiplied by each other. And so do reach out to them if you want to, to understand that because it was, it was gratifying to see that all of these building blocks are represented in that formula. Social Value International, um, those behind SROI have been doing this for over 20 years and, and um, have written really, there's a really important work on the Social Value International website you can also find, um, which will show you how these dimensions um, effectively provide the basis for monetization. Next slide, Joe, and then we'll go to Q&A. Um, 
it's just, I, I just want to wrap up this by the so what. So the final thing that the IMP did in terms of these norms was to say, if you look at performance, whether you're using a proxy um, and you're looking at that relative to a threshold, or you're able to get a full data set across those dimensions, you can interpret it and, and tell a story. You know, the data set will tell you, if, if you don't have a data set, then clearly that impact could be causing harm. So that's a given. But if you have a data set, you can look at it and say, well, well, relative to a threshold, if I can find a threshold, am I showing a high degree of change from an outcome that was negative, but I've made it less negative? And that would be your act to avoid harm. Or actually, am I going beyond that and showing that it's actually positive, it's above a threshold, in which case I can say that it's benefiting this population. Or can I go further still and say, not only is it above the threshold, that outcome is positive, but it's actually the baseline of the population that was experiencing it was previously underserved and would, would otherwise have been underserved if one thinks about the counterfactual, in which case it's not just benefiting, it's actually contributing to solutions. So those are nested as it were, because you can go from A, you know, it can be A and if not A, it could actually be going as far as B, but you could say, well, actually it's further than B, it's actually C, it's doing that for an otherwise underserved population. And then, so if you go to the next slide, Joe, you can look at this in your own time. Um, it just shows you the kinds of diligence questions you would ask to say, well, is this an A, B or a C? Um, if you go to the next one, Joe, the, this is just summarize what I've just told you. In other words, the performance on these different dimensions that you'd be looking for to argue whether an impact is A, B or C. And the reason why this is useful for a company overall is that in effect, if a company wants to pigeonhole itself and say, this is the type of impact I am having as a company, um, the, the truth is, is that a company's impact is just the, it's the combination of its underlying different impacts that it has on people and the planet. It's not actually to do with its governance structure or its intention, even though both of those things are hugely important. Um, it's actually to do with the reality of what the performance data is saying about what it's doing to people on the planet. And so if you go to the next slide, Joe, it just shows you that I'm actually going to ask you to go through these, Joe, to the, um, the one that shows all of the impacts. You know, the reality is a company's dashboard will look a bit like this. It will be a mix of different impacts that it's having. And it may have, it may not have information on all of those dimensions. It may just have a proxy. It may say, well, we provided training um, and we don't think that the workforce was, you know, particularly unskilled before. So we, we suspect that there was only a marginal improvement, but, um, you know, actually we can say that it's a positive outcome because their skill level is now at this level and that's above a threshold for what we think is, is good um, in this context. You might have a, a sort of data like that, a mix of data, which some of it's quite rigorous, some of it really isn't, but it will allow you to draw a conclusion about whether that impact for that particular stakeholder is an A, B or a C. And you can look across the company's different impacts and then tell a story about what is the overall company. And so if you have a look at the next slide, Joe, I'm just going to finish by saying it's a bit of a decision tree, really. I mean, if an enterprise is acting to avoid harm, that's what its impacts are showing, which is very much what you see in kind of responsible business, then it would be a collection of impacts that show a reduction of negative outcomes. If actually some of the outcomes are positive, then it would not just be an A, it would be a B. And if actually it's not just avoiding harm than actually benefiting, but there's some of those impacts which are also C's, then an organization you could imagine would position itself to the market. A company would say, I'm contributing to solutions, for example, to the SDGs. Um, and so that's really this kind of high level logic, which one can think of a bit like asset classes in finance, where, you know, you, of course you can look under the hood, but you can equally just say, well, this is a bond, or this is cash, or this is a private equity investment based on its high level characteristics one can similarly say that a company is is a b or c in that way um joe i'm going to go to q a now because i don't think that we need uh, everything else people can read through and that really covers the the guts of how does a company think about from the very granular level its individual impacts and the data one will collect up to the combination of its impacts and then position itself positioning itself in the market as having a particular type of impact. So over to you, Joe, to facilitate Q&A. Thank you so much, Clara. I'm just gonna pause the recording now as well.